Thurgood Marshall, the civil rights crusader, a man who was instrumental in ending legal segregation and later became the first African-American justice of the Supreme Court. In this special series we call Moments in History, we remember a man who challenged our legal system to create a more perfect union and forever change our country. Thurgood Marshall was born in 1908 in Baltimore, Maryland. His mother, an educator and father, a railroad porter, steered Marshall into a law career. After graduating with honors from Lincoln University, Marshall applied to the University of Maryland Law School but was denied because he was African American. So he traveled for an hour daily to Howard University Law School under the tutelage of a prominent NAACP attorney, Charles Hamilton Houston. One of the suggestions uh, made to Thurgood Marshall by Charles Hamilton Houston was to go to the deepest south, into those pockets of the country where resistance against equality and desegregation were the toughest, and pay attention to the people, listen to them, hear their stories, and understand that you are working for a cause that's bigger than being a lawyer, bigger than being a law graduate, bigger than even anything you can imagine in your life. And, and Thurgood Marshall took on that mantle. In 1934, Marshall graduated magna cum laude from Howard. The following year, he started a private practice and eventually succeeds his mentor, Charles Houston, to become the NAACP's chief counsel. During this time, Marshall systematically dismantles the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson ruling that upheld racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine. He argued 32 civil rights cases before the Supreme Court, winning 29. Uh, he wanted to establish the building blocks of earlier cases. He didn't want this issue to come up early in the litigation. And I learned a lot about how a person can try to influence the development of an issue over a long period of time. In fact, it was 13 years before Marshall had a chance to challenge separate but equal with the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954. The ruling ended segregation in the U.S. By now, Thurgood Marshall is a household name, but not everyone is in favor of the landmark decision. It took an enormous amount of guts. He told us the story about how he'd have to move sometimes two or three times a night from home to home in order to save safe. He told us the story about how he was very close to being lynched one time. It wasn't just his client, it was he uh, who was in danger. Justice Marshall was a great admirer of a man I wound up working for, Judge Harold Tyler. And uh, Tyler had been an assistant attorney general in charge of civil rights. One day in the fall of 1960, uh, Marshall was down in New Orleans uh, and was advised that the Klan was coming to get him that very night. Uh, he called Tyler. He had Tyler's phone number. Within an hour, the FBI uh, picked up Marshall and put him in a secure location and saw him through that. And Marshall credited Tyler with saving his life. The death threats didn't stop Marshall. After the Brown versus the Board of Education ruling, Thurgood continued to defend civil rights demonstrators until he was appointed in 1961 to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Of all his rulings, none were overturned by the Supreme Court, and by 1967, Thurgood Marshall became the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. It was fascinating to see the multiple aspects of his personality. The, personable, sociable storyteller, the precise taskmaster, just an amazing and remarkable, unique human being. What was delicious about, most delicious about the clerkship were these stories. And they ranged from hanging out with Langston Hughes and Lena Horne, Joe Lewis, meeting with Prince Philip, helping draft the Kenyan Constitution. So every single story, um, was like gold. One of Marshall's favorite stories, um, and Marshall told stories all the time. Many of them were about race relations, many of them uh, were serious subjects, but he always would tell a story with his booming laugh, and they always had a funny ending, even when he was making a very serious point. All the new judges were supposed to come up for a photo shoot, and the photographer blew a fuse while setting up his equipment. So uh, they called for an electrician. Who should walk into the room next? Thurgood Marshall. Uh, the secretary looked up at him and said, oh, you must be the electrician. He laughed about the story, and why did he laugh? 
because at the time the uh, trade unions in New York were all segregated, and he said, that woman must be crazy to think that I could be a member of the electricians union in New York City. By the time I was clerking, was very interested in hiring clerks who wanted to teach, and we were involved in the hiring process. And we asked him, why do you want people who want to teach? And he had a very long view about influence. He was very explicit. He said, of course, I want the smartest people. But he also said, I want people who will pass on uh, the, the lessons to a next generation. In 1991, Thurgood Marshall announced he was retiring from the bench. And it came as a complete shock to us. Um, the morning he did it, he called us in and he said, well, I've decided to give it up. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, I've already sent the letter to the president. There was this part of me who, until he said that, I was going to try to talk him out of it. No, you can't do this. You can't do it. He had already done it. And um, as far as I could tell, nobody in his chambers knew. And when reporters asked him why, well, I'm old. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting old and coming apart. <laughs> Two years later, Thurgood Marshall passed away at the age of 84. For the day of the funeral, um, we went to the National Cathedral. Uh, President Clinton was there, the Vice President, many senators, all these important Washington people. And at the end, um, word got around that the law clerks were invited uh, to the burial at Arlington. So we went there, and I assume that a lot of Washington dignitaries would be there, but that was not the case. And it was the law clerks and the family, and just as family was small. And Sissy Marshall at one point turned to us and said, uh, Thurgood regarded you as part of his family. And, and I guess we knew, and he wanted you to be here for this moment. And that was really wonderful. What made Thurgood Marshall an exemplary leader, in my view, is that he never stopped having utter empathy for common folk, people who were disadvantaged, and um, he dedicated his life to using the law to help those folk, regardless of color. It reinforced my interest in public service. When you have a role model like that, when somebody, who, a person like that is putting his life on the line in the interest of the ideals, it's very hard to want to do anything other than to find a way to give back. There's almost nothing any of us can do in this generation that rivals the level of commitment and risk that he put on the line uh, you know, for the causes he believed in. Today, you can find numerous memorials from coast to coast honoring Justice Thurgood Marshall, from courthouses to national airports, even the building I'm standing in now. For the U.S. Courts in the Thurgood Marshall Federal Judiciary Building, I'm Bridget Lyles. Thanks for watching.